Hey folks, I'm Mark Ryan. This is Super Review and this is the FIO FH5S, which as you can see is an in-ear monitor. In fact, this is the latest from FIO. I think their second IEM to come out this year. And the FH5S, kind of like the FH5 before it, is a four driver IEM, but the driver configuration here is actually different. There are two balanced armatures and actually two dynamic drivers, which is pretty interesting. That's a unique configuration for, I don't know, I, I can't think of many IEMs that have double dynamics, and I definitely can't think of any off the top of my head that are double dynamics plus balanced armatures. So a pretty interesting driver configuration for a hybrid. Now the price, like the FH5, it's not super cheap, but also not super expensive. In fact, this isn't even FIO's most expensive IEM that they've come out with this year, but I'm not totally certain on the price. I've seen this thing listed officially at like 280 bucks, but right now on Amazon, it's 250 bucks. So just assume that the price comes in somewhere around there. So I've actually had this for a couple of weeks, maybe like three weeks at this point, maybe four weeks at this point. I don't know, it's been a while. But I have been listening to this and comparing it to some other IMs in the price range, some other files, which we're going to talk about today. Uh, but also this was the, the subject of a video I did earlier this week about burn-in. File actually recommends a burn-in of 200 hours for this IM. And I did it because science, I suppose, although that's pretty poor science. But anyway, I don't know. We'll talk a little bit about the effects of the burn-in, but... Honestly, I'm not gonna talk too much about it because to my ear, it didn't make an obvious difference. All right, that's a spoiler. Anyway, like my other reviews, this is a live stream. So if you're watching now live and you have a question about the FH5S or any of the other IMs that we talk about today, leave it in the chat below. I'm gonna power through this review, give this thing a score, tell you everything that I think about the sound. And then at the end of the review, we'll have a little back and forth conversation. Uh, if you're watching this and it's a VOD and you missed out in the live chat, that's cool. I mean, you missed out, but it's cool. Uh, just subscribe to the channel and ding the YouTube bell so that YouTube lets you know next time I'm live, and then you can be here for the live conversation. But for everybody else, let's go ahead and dip into the review of the Fio Feo Fio FH5S. And let me go ahead and do the obligatory roadie wrap on screen. Um, while I start to talk about what comes in the box of this package, which is a pretty decent package for around 250 bucks. Uh, I did an unboxing of this earlier, which you can go back and find um, if you're interested, but here's, here's the short version of it. What you get inside the box is, of course, a pretty hefty selection of tips. This is pretty typical for FIO to include a lot of tips. Uh, they've got what they call them bass tips, vocal tips, balanced tips, They've got foam tips and they've even got these interesting biflange tips. I'll be honest though, I really only listen to these with the stock balance tips. Um, it's possible that these things would change the sound somewhat. You know, I have seen tips, ear tips change uh, frequency response noticeably, but um, yeah, I just did all my testing with the stock tips. So you get the tips, you also get a pretty nice little carry case and this is the same carry case that came with the file FD5. It is, in my opinion, a little bit on the big side. It's a little chonky, but it's very well made. And if you know, you're looking at like your only IM and you really want to take care of it, this is a pretty nice case, honestly, for that. Uh, it's, I'm pretty sure, not real leather. Let's give it the smell test. Mm, no, I mean, it smells like a nice shoe, a new shoe. Don't get it twisted, uh, but it doesn't smell like leather, but that's fine. Yeah, I think it's really nicely built. It's got this magnetic clasp on it. Pretty well done. Again, larger than I typically like, but not too shabby. They also included, let's see some interesting accessories. This here is, I think an MMCX cable connector remover. Um, I didn't actually use this. I, I personally don't really have much issue removing MMCX connectors, but you could, you know, if you're struggling with detaching MMCX cables, you could use this thing to ostensibly pry it. Let's see how that works actually. I'm afraid, I'm afraid. Okay, there you go. That was pretty easy. First time doing it live. Um, also inside the box, you get, of course, the little cleaning toothbrush, and then you see these little connectors over here, which are gonna bring us to the cable, uh, which I will start off and say, I think this is actually my favorite cable that I've ever had with a FIO IM. Now FIO, their cables are kind of, they're not necessarily the, the best behaved, but I would say that this cable is one of the better behaved cables 
Um, definitely the best that I've seen from Fio. So you can see, you know, it's maybe a little bit on the rubbery side, a little bit springy, but generally uh, it coils up well and it doesn't seem to keep memory. It seems to, seems to lie mostly flat. Uh, so generally pretty happy with that cable. But then as I was getting to, the, the termination down here is actually a pretty interesting mechanism. So like a, some other premium manufacturers lately, Fio actually includes um, swappable termination. So right here, I've got it with a 3.5 millimeter connection, but let's say you have actually a balanced output. You can unscrew this top, pull out this bottom part, and then you can see I could swap it to one of these, either 2.5 millimeter balanced or 4.4 millimeter balanced connectors, which I think is pretty slick. Uh, I'm, you know, I'm mostly, um, almost exclusively a 3.5 millimeter balanced kid, but uh, for the folks for whom balanced matters, it's nice that there is an option there and that they didn't have to either upsell you another cable or charge you more to include multiple cables inside the box. So I like that solution. Um, let's see, up here at the top of the cable, you've got, of course, your preformed ear hooks, and they are generally pretty good ear hooks. You got kind of like a, an angled MMCX connector there, and then that's gonna bring us to the ear pieces themselves, which I think are honestly pretty, pretty fantastic looking. These are nice looking IEMs. Um, a little bit of a, kind of like a future, like a robotic insect sort of look. It's got like this vented design on the outside. And I think, you know, I think Fio has advertised that these vents are somewhat related to the acoustics of it. Although if I'm perfectly honest, like I didn't hear any sound coming out of them. Sound isolation on these things seems about average. It doesn't seem like um, this is really like an open back IEM or anything like that, but it does have that aesthetic going for it. And I think it's pretty nice. The ear pieces are also like a lot of other Fio pieces. Let's see if we can get this clinking on camera. They're metal pieces, uh, very, very well built. You can see the nozzles here, not too long, but also not too short. Generally pretty happy with the build quality here, as is honestly pretty typical of Fio. Fio's pretty good at this kind of stuff. Uh, the other thing I'll point out while we're looking at these things, and then I'll give it a fit test, is that the earpieces actually have a handful of sound tuning switches on the back of them. Um, let me actually pull out this real quick. Because these switches are actually so small, I can't operate these with my fingers. In fact, I don't think Fio included anything in the box to make it possible to operate these, but a SIM ejector tool actually turns out to be a pretty good way of reaching in and just sliding these pins left and right. And they've got three pins. Uh, they are titled BMT or TMB. Um, basically, you've got a treble switch, a mid switch, and a bass switch. And they all do have some effect. Maybe I'll talk a little bit about that when we get to the sound. Um, but they do have an effect and it doesn't totally transform the sound, but it does change it pretty you know, significantly. So like I said, let's do a quick fit test and I'll talk about how these things fit. Generally, like other Fio IMs, I find these to be uh, on the comfortable side and generally well-fitting side. They're not necessarily the most secure fitting IMs, right? Like something like a Moondrop Blessing 2, or even like the Thea Audio stuff, it's a little bit more, it's a little bit more like pseudo custom fit. And those, those IMs really lock into place in my ears. These I found, uh, they fit in nice and easily, comfortably. There's, you know, no sharp edges or anything on these things touching the insides of my ears. It's just all smooth. But uh, security was not necessarily the strongest. So I did find myself just having to adjust them in my ears from time to time. I think, that is all that I need to talk about the physical aspects of this IM. So it's gonna lead us into talking about the sound. Uh, and like I typically do, I will start by just giving you a kind of high level description of the sound signature. And now I'm gonna use a term that I feel like I've been kind of overusing lately, but I would describe these as a bit of a mild V tune and a little bit on the bright side, frankly. Um, yeah, they're you know somewhat lean, I think strong in clarity. Uh, and, but there's still a pretty decent amount of bass there. Um, I would say, I would call it a sturdy bass and it's very present, but not overbearing. Um, that's just kind of like the general sound signature about it. You know, it does have a bit of a sparkle to it. Maybe it's a little bit on the sterile side, um, but generally that's kind of how I would describe it, right? A mild V, a little bit sterile, uh, a nice sturdy bass, but definitely not an overwhelming bass. And if you are looking for a bass cannon 
earphone, if you are looking for Gigabase, I don't think that's what you're gonna get here. But um, what I do like about the sound here is honestly that bass. I think the bass quality here on the FH5S is probably the best aspect of the sound. Um, again, it's not overbearing bass, it's not a ton of bass, but it's definitely emphasized, definitely above neutral bass. Uh, and it's just got like a really nice sturdy hit to it. Uh, it doesn't bloom, it doesn't bloat into the mid-range or anything like that. It's really well defined. Um, and it's pretty good with giving you sort of that percussive effect. Uh, it maybe decays a little bit quick, you know, compared to some other IMs. It'll give a, a little bit more body to the, to the bass, but generally I'm pretty happy with the quality of the bass here. Uh, in addition to being happy with the quality of the bass, I think the quantity uh, is just at about the right place for me, for my preferences. And, and maybe, you know, I would say this is probably a little bit bassier than my absolute preference, but I honestly have no qualms with the amount of bass here. Um, it's pretty good, it's meaty without, again, the muddiness, and it's just not overbearing at all. I think other things that I could say positive about the sound here on the FH5S is um, generally like clarity and cleanliness of the sound is very, very solid. I think there's a decent level of detail. Um, nothing really gets lost in the mix. Like it, it presents sound, I think again, it's a little, maybe a little bit on the sterile side, but the, the, what you get from that sterility, sterileness, I, one of those words is correct. Uh, what you get for that is just a really clean presentation with again, um, a, a nice sense of detail. Yeah, and then imaging and layering on this, I think is pretty solid. Not necessarily stand out, but I honestly, again, had no complaints about the, the, the definition and the separation between sounds. Everything is well-defined, maybe not the most spacious, but generally, I think, pretty solid there. Now, what I don't love about the sound here on the FH5S, honestly, it's the treble. The treble is, it's, it's too much, um, yeah. I think it's just kind of often irritating. It does, like I, like I described at the beginning, this is a little bit of a bright kind of forward uh, V-shaped sound signature. The tonality doesn't become off because of that, that V-shape, like it still sounds relatively natural and clean, but it does come with, I think, too much emphasis in sort of the, lo the lower treble region. And what that does, at least to my ears, is it just adds a little bit of, a little bit of raspiness and a little bit of sharpness to vocals. Um, I found that sibilance was frankly not, not handled very well here on the FH5S. And even like some cymbal strikes and stuff like that can come across, I found a little bit harsh. And because of that, I actually found myself listening to this at a quieter volume than I would typically listen to most other IEMs. Um, in fact, we'll, maybe we'll talk about that more when I talk about the FH3 comparison. Um, I actually felt that the, the bass on the FH3 came across stronger, even though it's leaner. Uh, just because I was frankly listening to the FH3 at a louder volume than I was here. Um, let's see. Anything else that I wanted to talk about? Okay, I did want to talk about or touch on briefly this the sound switches. So basically, you know, I, I mentioned there's a treble switch, a mid switch, and a bass switch. Pretty much what all of these switches do is affect the upper mid range and lower treble. And they basically just lower it by certain amounts, right? So uh, the, the theory here is that if you, uh, if you, lower, if you lower the upper mid-range and the lower treble, you effectively increase the mid-range. Or if you, um, actually, I guess it's more, it's more the opposite, right? These switches either increase or, or decrease the, the upper mid-range and the treble. And it's the, the, the switch that I think is the one that sounds the best on this is the bass switch. Turn the bass switch on, leave the other two off, and that does drop the upper mid-range and that treble presence a little bit, and it allows this to be, in my opinion, more listenable. It is still, however, uh, again, to my ear, I think overly sharp in the treble, even with that bass switch turned on, which again, um, just kind of has the effect of dropping the upper mid-range and the treble. Just unfortunately, to my ear, not quite enough. So that's what I think about the FH5S sound. Let's go ahead and bring in some other IMs for comparison, because I feel like people are gonna ask about these things. And for those who don't know, this is the, the Fio FH3. This is actually one of their, I, I don't know if I wanna call it a budget IM, but it's around 130 bucks. So about half the price of the FH5S. Uh, and while you get one fewer driver, right? This has got two balanced armatures and only one dynamic driver, um, but 
that's not really how we should be comparing the sound of these different IMs. We should talk about what do they actually sound like. And so I think the kind of the, the main difference is, again, this is a bit of a, a bright, mild V. I think this has kind of got a cleaner sound, maybe comes across a little bit stronger in the detail and, and a little bit stronger in transparency. This, however, the FH3, I would describe as actually stronger on mid-range, maybe slightly dirty in the mid-range, if, if that's a, a descriptor that means anything to you. But I think listening to these things head to head, it's like this comes across really clean. Again, a little bit on the sterile side. This just comes across a little bit fuller in the mid-range, uh, but slightly, slightly less clean sounding. Um, I think I, I did mention already that the bass on this, right? So the, the bass on the FH3, is mostly focused in the sub bass. There is some mid bass emphasis um, as it rises into the sub bass, but primarily the, the bass here is sub bass focus, where here in the FH5S, I think the bass is a little bit more balanced through the mid range or through the, the mid bass into the low bass. That said, I was actually surprised that I felt like the bass came across stronger here on the FH3. And again, I attribute that to the fact that I was listening to the FH3 a little bit louder um, just because of that treble presence here on the FH5S, I just I had to listen to this thing more quietly, which meant that the bass for my ear just didn't come across as strong as it did here. Maybe the bass is a little bit tighter here. Yeah, I would say the bass is a little bit better quality here generally, but um, if you're just looking for quantity of bass, I think that the FH3 actually did it better for me. Um, and then, you know, the treble quality here on the FH3 is not phenomenal. That was probably, you know, when I did my review of this, that was the one kind of knock against the, the audio quality. So the treble in here is actually, it's decent. It's pretty solid, and, but I don't, and I don't find it irritating, uh, but it's just not like the smoothest, best quality treble. That said, I would still pick the treble over the FH5S. Okay, so that is the FH3. Let's bring in actually one other file I am which is this guy right here. This is the FD5, which is another file, I think around 300 bucks. And I reviewed this one earlier this year. If you're interested in checking that out, check out, the, check out my YouTube channel uh, and just dig back not too long ago, you will find the review for the FD5. Now, the sound, the sound signatures of these is, is not, you know, it is actually fairly different. They're, these are both, I would describe V. Again, I would describe this kind of a mild V. This is just like straight up V. Um, this I would describe as a more bass dominant sound here over in the FD5. Again, there's a pretty sturdy bass presence here, but over here, it's definitely uh, a bigger bass. It, you could just say that it bleeds more into the mid range. Um, it's got just more body and just overall, just more dominates the sound signature of this, the, the earphone versus the bass in here, which I think is a polite balanced uh, volume level. Yeah, so that so that's a difference between them. Uh, again, I think the bass here is a little bit on the bloomier side, whereas here it's a little tighter and a little punchier. And in my review, you might remember if you saw that review, um, you know, I just got done complaining about the treble here on the FH5S. I actually complained about the treble here on the FD5 as well. Uh, I found it a little bit sharp again in the lower treble, but in head to head comparison here, I actually found the treble on the FD5 a lot more pleasant and listenable. You know, it's still, it still can be a, little, a tad on the sharp side, but um, just not nearly as fatiguing as I found the treble spikes here on the FH5S. Um, I, I, I don't know if, if this is a useful description between these two, but I did write it down. Uh, the FD5 I would kind of describe as maybe a more musical sound uh, and the FH5S being a little bit more on the clinical side. And now for my final comparison in this video, let me pull in another IM that I've reviewed recently. And this is the Fiat Audio Legacy 5, which I think is around 250 bucks. So basically the same price as the file. I think uh, build quality and stuff in the file is, is a step above, but fit, I actually prefer the fit here on the Legacy 5. But the bigger difference is gonna be in the sound signature. And again, if you remember my review of this somewhat recently, um, the Legacy 5 is more of a, a mid-range focused tuning. Um, the treble, I think, on the F, on the, the Legacy 5 is a little bit airier. Um, so there is more emphasis in the upper treble, but even though there's more emphasis here in the upper treble, I still don't find it nearly as fatiguing as the FH5S treble. In fact, I, I think the treble is pretty well done on the, the Legacy 5. One of the reasons I like this thing so much. 
Um, I think in the mid-range, you know, not just is the tuning better and more more leaned toward the mid-range, but I think the Legacy 5 actually gives you better sense of detail and like vocal, um, not necessarily clarity, but just kind of like that micro texture in vocals and stuff to me comes across stronger on the Legacy 5. Uh, the bass is quite a bit leaner on the Legacy 5, which can be a good thing or a bad thing. Honestly, like I think I like the bass better here on the FH5S, but the Legacy 5 bass is not bad. It's just more sub bass focused and a little bit lean in the mid bass. I did find, however, with a 15 ohm adapter, uh, this picks up a little bit of mid bass and then it gets a little bit closer, but uh, I'm not gonna expect you to go out and try that. So that is kind of like my descriptive differences between these different earphones. Um, I was also gonna do kind of like a, I don't know if I'm gonna make this a regular part of my reviews, but it seemed like it might be a useful thing. So I'll try and do it here again. Um, it's just rank these in different categories, right? So I've got four different earphones and a handful of different categories. How do I rank these things? So just an outright bass quantity, right? If you're just looking for the most bass quantity, I would say that the FD5 is probably first to my ear. The FH3 is probably second, the FH5S is probably third, and then Legacy 5 is fourth, right? So that would be, is it, can we do this? How, how, is that, how, do we, how do we rank these things? How do I fit these things in all on my screen? Let's move stuff aside. Let's do it like this. There's a first for everything. All right, so this is how I would rank uh, them in terms of base quantity. Number one, the FD5, FH3 is number two, FH5S number three and Legacy five with the least base quantity. Now, in terms of base quality, I think the order changes up a little bit. The way that, honestly, I think the FH5S probably has the best base quality. Um, it's just, it's tighter, it's punchier. Uh, again, maybe it decays a little bit fast, but I think that is probably my favorite. Next up would be the FH3, which in some ways, in some ways I do actually prefer the base here. It's a little more sub base focused. Um, but maybe not quite as um, tight and controlled as it is there. And then next, I would probably say that the Legacy 5, again, a little lean on the bass, but you know the sub bass is pretty strong. But the FD5, even though it has, I think, the most amount of bass to my ear, it's just the loosest and kind of the bloomiest bass. So, you know, I think bass heads would still prefer this one. But for me, how I like bass represented in my music, this is how I would rank them. One, two, three, four mid-range uh, this order changes up a little bit more let's see i think legacy 5 is probably the top mid-range i would actually leave the legacy 3 or sorry the the fh3 as second place and then i would ooh, i would probably give it to the fh5s and then leave the fd5 down here this is kind of how i would rank them in terms of mid-range quality um, yeah legacy 5 really solid fh3 i think also really solid FH5, it's it's clean and sterile and decent mid-range. Um, maybe a little bit, yeah, it, I, where do I draw the line at where I'm complaining about treble versus mid-range? Uh, this is kind of in that, in that gray zone. Uh, and then here in the FD5, it's just a little bit on the recessed and kind of clouded from that base. And then finally, let's rank them in terms of treble quality. And I would probably just swap these two around. I would say that you know the Legacy 5 has pretty solid treble in it. Again, decent sense of air. The FH3 treble, not the best quality, but generally well-tuned, and I don't really have any issues with um, the, the volume level of treble. FD5, I did have some issues with the lower treble, giving vocals a bit of an edginess, a bit of a sharpness, but I can listen to this and then hear the FH5S. Finally, I would say, in my, in my opinion, has the, the, the worst tuned treble here. Maybe, yeah, I think the treble detail is probably better on the FH5S than it is here on the FD5, but it's just too sharp that I, I, I don't really love it. So, all right, that was a lot. But at the end of all of that, I'm gonna go ahead and give this thing a score. And out of five stars, I'll give the Fio FH5S still solid three stars. You know, you got a really nicely built earphone here with, again, I think a pretty solid bass presentation. Solid mid-range detail level. Tonality is even pretty solid, even you know, maybe a little bit on the, on the lean side, but I'm okay with that. It's just, unfortunately, that treble never really gets to a point where I really enjoy listening to this thing. It's not a bad listen, 
but it's a bit much. And unfortunately, 200 hours of burn-in didn't really change that for me. So that is my review of the File FH5S. If you're interested in checking out this earphone or any of the other ones we just talked about, I do have links in the description down below. And while you're down there, if you found this video helpful, please hit the like button, subscribe to the channel if you're not already, and ding that YouTube bell so that you can be around for the next time we have a live conversation like I'm about to have with the folks that are here right now. If you're not here live, I'll catch you later. If you are here live, let's chat. All right, whew, that felt like a lot. Did I leave any questions unanswered with that comparison? Probably. Got a little tangle situation going on down here. But yeah, let me catch up with the live chat as best as possible. Pythagoras, how's it going? Glad to see you. In fact, I, have I seen you before? It's good to see you. Big Boss, greetings. Transient Snail, nice to see you again. Demetrio Alvarez, good to see you again. Big Boss, oh, I needed to update my description of the video, thank you. Yeah, I miss that one all the time. I'll, I'll, I'll check it after this, after this live chat. Cheebs, how's it going? Nice to see you in the in chat. Joseph Joestar, it's a lot of Joes. Nice to see you as well. Sebastian Alcaron, that's right, you'll get a dab too. It's not just for DNT Arc. Although DNT Arc gets two dabs. Uh, Albert asking, does burning in the IM produce heat? Uh, I don't know if you're asking that facetiously, but um, I did, I mean, I could imagine it could potentially, depending on how um, the, the earphone is designed, but no, I did not feel any heat while burning in the FH5S. It doesn't seem out of the realm of possibility though, because you are driving electricity through a thing. And generally, I mean, I don't think it's the case necessarily with, with, with uh, transducers that are producing sound, but a lot of things that you, you run power into the performance limit of them is heat dissipation, right? So like a con internal combustion engine, how fast can you, can you, uh, or how much horsepower can you get out of it? Kind of depends on how much heat can you remove from it. Same for, you know, computer parts. Maybe that applies in some ways to IAMs, but I've definitely never felt an IAM get warm. William Mendonca, nice to see you again. DNT Arc waiting for the 400 hours review. Yeah, so I have only burned in the FH5S for a mere 200 hours. Um, I'm gonna continue burning it in for at least another 200 hours, maybe another 600 hours, and then we'll come back. I'm just kidding, I'm not gonna do that. 200 hours, it turns out, is a long time to leave this amplifier just busy burning in the FH5S. Probably not a thing I'm gonna do typically, but for science, for an experiment, it was worth it. Uh, Albert, Chib, you're asking me, will I do another burn-in session after this? I, I am not planning to do any more burn-in on the FH5S. That said, I am planning to measure, re-measure more of my IEMs after I'm done reviewing them. So basically what I've been doing lately is I've unboxed them and I measure them directly out of the box, which gives me like kind of a nice control. And then throughout my typical review process, let's say I listen to an IM maybe like 20 hours. That, that, that sounds about right. You know, over the course of a week or two, I'll listen to it for about 20 hours. Definitely not 200 hours, but 20 hours I can do. And I think within that 20 hours, there's a decent chance that if this burn-in thing is a, a thing that happens a lot, within that 20 hours, I will be able to measure some difference. So I'm planning to, at the end of my reviews, measure things again, and then I'll throw that up on squiglink, squig.link, if you haven't heard of it yet. Um, that is where I put all my frequency response measurements. Um, and then there I can, you can see what it looks like with zero hours of burn-in and 20 hours of burn-in or, or whatever. I'll call it the post-review burn-in. Big Boss saying that cable, that kind of cable is pretty sick. Yeah, I think this is a good solution. And you can see that the FD5 has the same 
uh, the same screw-on termination solution. I think this is a pretty nice solution because as you can see, this termination isn't really much larger than a typical 3.5 millimeter. I mean, it's maybe a little bit larger, but it's not larger enough that it stands out. Uh, and I think that's a just a pretty elegant way to give users the options to do balanced or unbalanced, depending on what they what their setup allows. Big Boss, you're saying the Dunu connectors seem too bulky. I definitely thought that they would be bulky based on pictures, but once I got them, I was actually surprised at how compact they are. That said, I I don't know. The Dunu connectors feel nicer, uh, but I do actually still prefer having a straight a straight jack versus a, a 90 degree bend. But at this point, I've got so many different cables with different solutions that I've, I've become a little bit numb to that. Joseph Joestar are calling this dragon scale design. I think that's a good way to describe this. Is that how Fio describes this as dragon scales? I can see that. It's pretty slick. Sai, hey, nice to see you again. And then you're saying, Sai, that the white ones, which the FH5S, for those who don't know, comes in black, it also comes in a white color. You're saying that the white ones in person look way more beautiful. The black just seems generic to me. So yeah, the whites look pretty slick. Um, I mean, I like the way that the black ones look, but if I were buying it for myself, I'd probably be pretty tempted to go with the, the lighter color. And DNTR, you, you heard, and I, and I think I heard this too, you heard that if you, so if we go back to the table, the um, talking about these base switches, DNTR heard that if you input the Konami code on these things, what did you say? Uh, da, 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 you, you, all of my music becomes high res. I think that's actually true. If you can input the Konami code on here, up, up, down, down, left, right, left, right, BA, BA, select, start, um, all of your music becomes high resolution, which is really cool. And you'll also have to be uh, subscribed to Apple Music. And not listening on AirPods. David K saying switches in theory are nice, but not sure how applicable IRL. Yeah, you know, there's there's been a handful of IMs that I've reviewed with switches on them. And I'm trying to think like how much, how many of them have I have I really used? And I don't know. Let's see, like the Dunu SA6 has a switch that increases the bass. I think when I reviewed it, I said that I preferred it without the switch, but lately when I've been listening to it, I actually prefer it with the switch on, which again, increases the sub bass, kind of gives it a little bit better depth. Um, so there you go, there's an example. The Legacy 4, the Thea Audio Legacy 4, has a switch on it. It's actually got two switches, but really only one. And that switch takes it from kind of a, a mild V-shaped tuning to somewhat more of a, a neutral tune. So there I would say it's actually, you know, it's it's almost significant enough that you're getting two different sound signatures. The here on the FH5S, I did find that turning on the bass switch improved the sound for me. But you could have also, it just meant that the other sounds, the other sounds were just more irritating in terms of the treble for me. So um, I, I, I guess I would rather them start from a less irritating point and then like tamer from there. But I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. The switches thing, it does seem mostly vaguely gimmicky. And Sheebs, yes, you are correct. When you input the Konami code on the FH5S, not only does all your music become high res, uh, but high res stickers will actually fall out of the sky. Oh, Big Boss asking, I wonder if the HANA comparison will come up. Um, I didn't compare this to HANA for a couple of reasons. One, um, 
I don't think a lot of people are going to be cross shopping the HANA in this, although I did describe them kind of similarly as bright Vs. Um, two, I don't actually have the HANA on, on hand right now. It's out on loan, um, which with a review showing up on Dent Reviews, if you want to see that one coming up soon. Um, and then, yeah, I don't know. It's a single dynamic driver. It's, it's pretty big difference. Not really a whole lot of points of comparison. Although I would just say right now, I prefer the HANA quite a bit. Magid Bostros asking, uh, I think the FH5S needs an amplifier, right? And I would say no. I think, I mean, of all of the IEMs that I listen to here, the I would say these two are the two that maybe required the most amount of volume, but neither of these, I don't think they, 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 they'll work fine off of any portable source, I think. I don't think you'll have any issues with, the, with volume. I don't think you'll need an external amplifier or anything to run the FH5S. Big Boss asking if FH3 got four stars, right? Actually, the FH3, I gave five stars. I think still, you know, I, we have to remember that's a $130 earphone. So when I'm being critical of the treble, it's it's kind of within the context of, of everything. But then when I get to my score, within the context of five star IEM, or $130 IEMs, I think the FH3 is probably my favorite, honestly. Jeremy Kiro saying the description is still hibby. Yep, you are correct. I will fix that in a bit. Thank you. My Life Matters. So you also got the FH5S. What are your thoughts on it? Have you burned it in for 200 hours? Because until you burn it in for 200 hours, I don't want to hear your opinion. That's not true. I'm just kidding. Some people be like that, though. I don't get it. Brent Galton saying FH5 versus FH5S. So yeah, that's, you might be wondering why did I not compare the FH5 to, or the FH5S to the previous FH5. I actually have the FH5, it's sitting over there. Unfortunately, my FH5 has got a, it's developed a really significant channel imbalance, so I can't really listen to it. That said, the last time I listened to it versus the FH3, I found them to be pretty similar. So, Based on my memory and based on the fact that I like the FH3 a lot more than the FH5S, I think you're probably best off, honestly, with the original FH5. And Cheeb's saying there might be a mod that could save the FH5S, and I think you're right. I'm actually tempted to play around with some, some modifications. Although, if we go back to the hardware here, it's not going to be easy to get inside of here. Maybe I'd like, have to pop off that grill or something, which could go really bad. We'll see. We'll see. I am I am kind of tempted though. Oh, YouTube chat did that thing where it skips past everything. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Versail saying that people here are mocking the 200 hours burn in, but it did change the sound of the FH5S quite a bit. I mean, as we, we, I'll use, I'll use in scare quotes the, the word proved uh, on that live stream, the frequency response of the FH5S did change after 200 hours of burn in. To my ear, when I listened to it, it just sounded exactly like I remembered. Um, I think I, in the, the burn in live stream, I suggested that that difference is probably a difference that I could hear. And I think it is a difference that I could hear if it hadn't been over a week since I heard the pre-burned in sound, right? If I was able to AB them instantly, have, a, have it like just a switch that turned it from burned in to not burned in, I think I'd be able to hear that difference. But with 200 hours in between the original state and the burned in state, there's, yeah, there's nothing for me to pick up. Crimson SV saying, am I the only one who doesn't find the treble on these too hot? You're probably not. Look, treble is, I think, a very, a very personal thing. And audio isn't generally, but um, I mean, this is a thing that I can kind of demonstrate when I'm measuring an IEM is depending on, you know, how deeply I fit an IEM into the, the microphone that I use, where the treble resonates and where it like creates amplification can change, right? So 
if I can create that difference just by inserting the IM deeper or less deep into a microphone, just imagine how many differences are gonna happen when it goes into my ear versus your ear. Maybe even people's like left ears and right ears might be different enough that you are creating significant differences in the frequency response. So um, if you if you are fine with the treble on the FH5S, like honestly, do not let my my take change what you feel about this, okay? Because your ears are different than my ears and that is perfectly normal, perfectly expected. And um, yeah, it's fine. Rob Hawk asking, what is the best hybrid that I have reviewed? Uh, I mean, I reviewed the, the 64 Audio Trio. That's probably my favorite hybrid. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I would go with the, the, the Trio. If you didn't want to spend $3,000, maybe, yeah, like the, the, the Moondrop Blessing 2, I think is a really, really solid hybrid for only 300 bucks, which is still a lot of money. Ahobaka saying, considering the overall tonality, timbre, and quality, which one do you prefer over the, of the FH5S and the FD5? So yeah, I talked about some comparisons between, move these out of the way. I talked about comparisons between the FH5S and the FD5, but I guess I didn't really tell you which one I would take personally. I, I prefer listening to the FD5, honestly. And mostly it's just because the treble on this I find more fatiguing. Um, whereas here, it can be a little bit irritating sometimes, but not on the same level as the treble here, unfortunately. Um, again, I think detail and, and, and definition is stronger here on the FH5S and the tonality I probably prefer on the FH5S. The bass quality I prefer on the FH5S. So in, in a lot of ways, I prefer this one. Uh, but when it comes to just actual listening enjoyment, I, I find the, the FD5 you know, it's a thing. It's not necessarily my thing, but it's a thing and it's fairly well done. So I would pick the FD5. And then Ahobaka following up, how would you rate either of those versus the Moondrop Blessing 2 Dusk? Um, I like the Moondrop Blessing 2 Dusk quite a bit better than Quite a bit better than all of these, if I'm perfectly honest. The mid-range resolution on the Blessing 2 and the Dusk is just phenomenal. And that's what that's that's the thing that gets me. Wow, Brent Galton, I'm giving him five minutes before they pull the trigger on the FH5S or the FH7. So I haven't heard the FH7, I'm not gonna be able to give you any advice on that one. I don't know what that one sounds like. Uh, Muhammad saying, I think we need to separate ratings by sound, build, and value. If we combine it into one rating, the rating will be a bit confused. Does the IM have good spilled sound because it's cheap? Just my thoughts. Yeah, I mean, look, there's a lot of different thoughts on rating systems and I try not to put too much into it. That's why I just went with a really simple five star score. For me, if you want that resolution of, of, of opinion, like how does the build quality, how good is the build quality, how good is the sound, how good is the fit, how good are the accessories? Like that's to me what the, the content of the review is for. Not just my reviews, but other people's reviews as well. The reason I put scores at the end is I think sometimes you can, you know, with a lot of words, not be totally certain about where a person stands on whether or not they like a thing. And so for me, the score is just kind of like the final punctuation of, this is overall how I feel about this. And maybe it would be also useful to go into, to give that punctuation to different categories, but I, I think it'll just muddy things up to be honest. Oh, and then Brent Galton. I, I appreciate the uh, 
the honesty on the impetus behind you rushing to buy an IEM. Wife will be home soon. Can't let her be here for this purchase. <laughs> Uh, it's a, the recipe for a good, a good decision. Sai saying, I tried the FD5s myself, thanks to a friend, and, and I agree with your assessment. I think the FD5's treble is hotter than the FH5S. Interesting. Okay. Like I said, different ears. Hi Lei saying, I'm late, what are my thoughts? The short version is, I don't love it. There's some nice things about the FH5S, good bass quality, but the treble is, is, is too sharp for me. I did find it didn't take a lot of EQ to bring the treble down to uh, a more enjoyable level. Like honestly, just minus two, minus three dB between 5K and 8K helps that out quite a bit. Um, it still doesn't get rid of the sibilance. Like I really couldn't break out the sibilance, which is part of why like, I think sibilance isn't just a function of frequency response, but I don't have a way to prove that. Uh, I couldn't break it out entirely, but by dropping that range by about two to three dB, it did make it quite a bit more pleasant to my ear. Christopher Denny asking, does a balanced 2.5 millimeter jack sound better and put out more power than a standard 3.5 millimeter? And the answer to that is more complicated than it should be. Um, I'm just gonna say shortly no, but yes, which didn't help at all. Um, it really depends on the implementation of the device. Most devices that have both a 3.5 millimeter and a balanced, either 2.5 or 4.4, most devices with both will have double the power on the balanced. And that's just kind of a, a factor of how they design the circuits. There's nothing inherent about balanced versus unbalanced that means that balanced can, ha can be more powerful, right? This, uh, this amplifier back here is single ended only and it's got more power than any balanced digital audio player that I played just kind of as an example. Um, so yeah, it, most players that have both, you'll have more power on the balance, but it's just because of how it's designed. Sound quality, sometimes again, players that have both balanced and unbalanced on them, sometimes the, the designers of the hardware builders will put more effort into the balance and make it actually sound better. But again, it's not really because balanced is doing anything. Then <sighs> maybe that's a controversial statement, but like I just, I just don't think that balanced, um, balanced audio makes a difference when we're talking about, you know, a four foot long cable or a six foot long cable that we're listening to with headphones. It's certainly not a big enough difference that I care about it. Uh, Jeremy Kiros actually asking an interesting question that I'm not going to be able to answer. At least I don't think so. You're asking, what do the switches actually do on the back of the FH5S? So we talked about this thing having switches. What are those things actually doing? I don't know exactly because one, I haven't opened it up. And two, I, even if I did, I wouldn't know what I was looking at. But I did play around with, we've got one on hand. I did play around with, oh my gosh, I almost lost it. Uh, these little things. This is an impedance adapter. Basically, if I throw this onto my cable like this, I can still plug it into my 3.5 millimeter output, and this adds 15 ohms of impedance. Why would anyone want to do that? A handful of different reasons, but uh, why these things are kind of fun to play with is that these will typically alter the frequency response of an earphone. And when I put this onto the FH5S, I actually took a measurement of it, and it seemed like the effect of adding impedance was basically the exact same effect that you get with these switches. So I can't say for certain, but my guess is that these switches are toggling some sort of internal, some sort of internal uh, routing of electricity that is increasing the impedance 
um, by turning the switches on or off, increasing or decreasing, I guess. Mr. Gent, I see you are speculating it's a crossover switch, which I, I don't even know what a crossover switch does, so I can't say that it's not that. Maybe a crossover switch is just a switch that adjusts impedance, but um, I really wouldn't be surprised if what's happening internally on the FH5S is just like routing electricity through more impedance. YouTube, you scrolled me again. Nicholas with an interesting question saying, I just recently bought the Harmonic Dyn Zeus. Uh, really loving the sound of the headphones. Are there any IMs that I recommend that have a similar sound signature to the Zeus? And a lot of times I have difficulty comparing headphones to IMs. Uh, I mean, I could describe, I could find one that like is Harman neutral in an IM and Harman neutral in a headphone and they're kind of similar, but maybe not totally. That said, with the Harmonic Dyne Zeus, that's kind of got like this bassy, mid-bassy warm tune with a decent level of treble clarity on it. And I think an IM that fits that description uh, would be something like the Blonde BLO3 actually. It's not gonna be an exact match, but I think that's a fair, a fair equivalent in the IM space. So yeah, the Blonde BLO3. Ernesto Prieto, nice to see you. Thanks for watching, appreciate it. Size asking, do I think burn, is in, burn in is essential for an IM to sound good? Haven't really tried burning myself. I, I, no, I don't think so. I think, you know, we did show with the burn in test with the FH5S that there was a measurable difference, but again, to my ear, it did not change how I felt about the sound. The way that I just described the sound of the FH5S during this review is a, pretty much how I would have described it two weeks ago before I burned it in. Ryan Black asking, how high would I say the Blessing 2 and the Dusk punch above their weight class? I would say pretty high, honestly. Like, I think if the Blessing 2 was a $700 IM, it would not be overpriced. I'll just say that. Based on what I've heard. Uh, Chris Denny, I see you asking again about the balance stuff. I said that I don't think that there's a sound difference. You're asking, and I think maybe this is an important follow-up question, why do people care? And the people care because they think that there, there should be a sound difference. And, and there's a good technical explanation for why balance actually does make a difference. The thought is, and, and I'm, again, I'm probably going to describe this incorrectly as I tend to, uh, but the way the balance works is it, it basically like kind of sends, um, it sends the same signal. Let's see, how do, how do I, how do I, how do I say this correctly? Uh, it, it basically sends the same signal two different times. Uh, one of them I think is inverted or something like that. And then what balance is meant to do is deal with electrical interference. Okay. Any sort of electrical signal you send over a wire long enough, if there's elect, you know, let's say like radio frequencies or something going on, uh, RF, you got Wi-Fi, you've got other power lines and stuff crisscrossing themselves, you're creating electrical interference. Again, sorry for this description for all the electrical engineers out there. Um, but there are ways to create electrical interference out there in the world. And if that happens in between your audio source and your head, it could result in like static sound or, or just some other sort of interference, all right? And balanced is a, a solution to that problem. I don't need to, I guess I don't actually need to get into the description of how it works because again, I'll probably get it wrong, but um, just assume that it does work. 
The reason I don't really care about balanced is I don't have electrical interference problems in between my source and my head. There's just like a four foot long cable. It's not run, running along power, power lines or anything like that. Like I just, electrical interference is not a thing I deal with. I, if it's happening, I'm not hearing it. If I were, you know, building a stage for a, a band, a live band, and you had just cable, like 50 foot cables all over the place, crisscrossing each other, there's a pretty good chance of electrical interference there. And you might as well just run everything balanced um, just to, to, to rule out that problem. But for, for my purposes, for personal audio, I find it really unnecessary. And I find that the reason I don't like using balanced is it just means everything in my audio world becomes less intercompatible. And I like being able to listen to my earphones, to my digital audio player. If I switch to listen to watching a YouTube video, I can just pull it out, plug, that's not where my audio player. I can pull it out of my audio player, plug it into my laptop, plug it into my iPad, go to a different audio player, go to my amp. I prefer to everything to just be compatible. So that to me matters more than canceling out electrical interferences that I just have never experienced. Sebastian asking, what are my thoughts on Cost Porter Pro with MMCX mod? I mean, I love the Porter Pro. The MMCX mod will make it more durable, I suppose, for the long run. Um, I haven't done it myself, but I do actually have the parts for it and I've attempted it multiple times. I'm just really bad at soldering really small things. I, you could probably just stop and say, I'm really bad at soldering, but I'm really bad at soldering really small things. MMCX connectors are tiny. Uh, Lorvald asking, which cable do I have on my file FH3? So, good eye, yeah, I do have an aftermarket cable here. This is, the, the brand is called Xiaofan, and I've linked to them before. They're on AliExpress. Um, I like this cable quite a bit. Unfortunately, they've stopped selling this cable, and I, I'm not sure what the deal is with this brand. They make a bunch of different cables ranging from around $35 for this cable to upwards of like $2,000 for some other cable. And unfortunately, this cable is no longer listed and the only cables they have are more expensive. So uh, I don't know that I would recommend the more expensive ones if they ever sell this $35 cable again. I think this is a really nice cable. Again, Xiaofan was the brand, but last time I checked on Alley, it wasn't available anymore. DS Editor, how's it going? Nice to see you. All right, let's see. I think that might just do it for this video. Um, I do have to cook dinner. So again, like I do, like, I don't know where I was going with that. Thank you all for tuning in to this live stream. Really appreciate the conversation and the questions. You guys make this thing interesting. Uh, if you want to carry on the conversation, I do have a link to my Discord server in the description down below. And while you're down there, if you haven't already, please hit the like button. It helps me out, helps other people find the channel. Subscribe to Super Review if you haven't already. Ding the YouTube bell, and then I'll see you on the next one. Until then, have a good weekend.